Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths. Notice where you feel the breathing and how it feels. You know consciously that there's air coming in and out of the nose, but there's more to the breathing process than that. There's a flow of energy that goes through the body, expands the rib cage, so that the air can come in and go out. The air is not doing the breathing. The body is doing the breathing. And it's the body's doing of the breathing that we want to pay attention to. So when the impulse to breathe in comes, where does it start? Different people will sense it in different places, and often as your mind settles down, you'll get more and more sensitive to where that impulse starts and how it flows through the body, and whether it's flowing well or not. The parts of the body that seem to be tense that you can relax, allow them to relax, while at the same time maintaining your erect posture. And think of the breath energy flowing throughout the whole body, through all the nerves, through all the blood vessels, out to every pore. What you're trying to do here is get the body to be a place where you can be aware of the whole body with a sense of ease, with a sense of being connected. So that you're happy to stay here. Otherwise, if there are little impulses here and there, little knots of energy that get tied up, the mind tends to run with those and go off someplace else because it doesn't like being here. And that can be for any, any number of reasons. One is just simple boredom. You don't see anything happening right here, and you don't want to make up a good story to keep the mind entertained. Or you have actually some serious business to take care of. But for the time being, none of that counts. No matter how serious the business this is more serious. Because this area of your awareness, the sense of the breath energy flowing in and out of the body, as you breathe in and breathe out. As Buddha said, if you're ignorant of this, this can become a cause for suffering. And his explanations for the steps that lead up to craving and then from craving into suffering. There's something called fabrication. And what's interesting about fabrication is it comes before your consciousness. It's how you prime yourself to sense things. And then if you're ignorant of this, your consciousness can lead to all the other links in the connection that lead to suffering. But if you bring knowledge to this process, it turns all those links into part of the path. And when we're focused on the breath, we're in touch with all the different kinds of fabrication. There are three in all. There's bodily fabrication, which is the in and out breath itself. The verbal fabrication, what the Buddha calls directed thought and evaluation. Put that in simple terms, it's the mind's conversation with itself. All the voices of the committee, all the various members of the committee that get in on the conversation. You bring a topic to the committee and everybody talks about it, passes judgment on it, gives recommendations, asks questions. That inner conversation can prime you to suffer a lot if you're not careful. And then there's mental fabrication, which are feelings of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain, and then perceptions, the labels you apply to things. Sometimes these labels are conscious, and sometimes they're very unconscious. And so what we're doing as we focus on the breath is we're dealing directly with all three types of fabrication. You've got the in and out breath, and you've got your committee here talking about the breath and how well you're staying with the breath. And there will be some committee members who come and say, hey, let's think about something else. And you've got to talk to them in a way that brings everything back. 
whether you banish them outside the wall or you try to win them over with a sense of ease of the breath. That depends on the situation. And then the feeling of ease that comes as you begin to settle in with the breath. The steadier your awareness, the smoother the breath becomes. And the perception you hold in mind about what's happening as you breathe, where the breath energy comes in, how it moves. There you are. You've got all those types of fabrication, and you're trying to get more and more conscious of them. You can see if there's any one of them that's conducive to suffering or conducive to craving. Then you can change it. Because the difference between whether this is going to be an experience of suffering or not, as the Buddha said, is whether you apply the Four Noble Truths. And you're applying the Four Noble Truths is not just remembering what the words say. It's a series of questions. It's a problem-solving attitude. Where is the unnecessary stress here? What are you doing to cause it? What can you do to stop it? Those are the questions that lie behind the Noble Truths. In particular, what are you clinging to? That passage we chanted just now has an unusual phrase. In fact, the very first one, those who don't discern suffering. And you think, well, everybody discerns suffering, but not clearly. All too often you hear people saying, well, the Buddha taught that life is suffering. He never said that. He said something a lot more precise. He goes through the different aspects of life that are suffering. Aging is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering. You can't argue with that. Not getting what you want is suffering. Having to be with things you don't like, having to be separated from those that you do like, that's suffering too. Those are all examples. But what lies at the heart of suffering, he says, is clinging to the five aggregates. That, to see that is to discern suffering. And again, you've got the aggregates right here. They sound foreign. The word aggregate is an unfortunate translation. But it's the form of the body. Okay, you've got the form of the body sitting right here. Feelings. You've got the feelings of ease or dis-ease right here. Again, perceptions, the labels you're applying as you keep the breath in mind. Fabrication, that's directed thought and evaluation, and consciousness. Okay, they're all here, too. And if you cling to them in an unskillful way, it's going to cause suffering. So you ask yourself, how are you clinging in an unskillful way here? For the time being, you do want to hold on to the concentration. That's nothing you want to let go of. We're talking today about how often when you hear about jhana, for years and years and years it used to be, they would tell you about John and then immediately tell you it was dangerous and tell you not to go there. Which is not what the Buddha said. You never find any place where the Buddha says John is dangerous. That the only danger he said is you get there and you get a little bit lazy about moving on. Because you like it so much. But that danger is very easy to overcome compared to the danger of not having jhana, not having good solid concentration. Because in that case you go for sensuality, and people kill one another over, over sensuality. That's why we have wars, that's why we have crazy politics. Nobody's killed anybody else over jhana. Even though they have jhana wars, nobody dies. But you want to Hold on to a good state of concentration. Hold on to the pleasure that comes to the concentration so you can look at your other forms of clinging and see that they're really not worth it because you've got something better here. There's the clinging to sensuality, the mind's fascination with thinking about how good a sensual pleasure is going to be and then remembering how good it was. And as we, again, as we said today, how much people dress up the pleasure to make it seem worthwhile. And the reason we do that is we think that the only alternative sensual pleasure is pain. But here the Buddha is saying, here's something else. Here's a better pleasure. The pleasure that comes just sitting here with the mind very still and very balanced. 
with a sense of the energy in the body flowing evenly and smoothly throughout, and your awareness allowed to spread. So it's not confined to one little spot. You be aware of the whole body. Once you have this, it's a lot easier to look at the way you dress up sensual pleasures and realize it's not really worth it. You can gain some distance from them. And the same with the other forms of clinging. There's clinging to views, clinging to habits and practices. In other words, having the idea that this has to be done that way and that has to be done this way without any real consideration of what are the real effects of doing it this or that way. Clinging to views in the sense that you say, okay, having this view makes me a better person, or just having the right view about something will make God like me or whoever is passing judgment on things. You can begin to see that a lot of views that we have, a lot of the ways we do things are actually harmful. And having a good state of concentration help, helps you to step back from that. Of course, we have views for the path, but then we use these views consciously as tools, not as ends in themselves. And you've got the habits or the precepts, and you've got the practices of meditation. Okay, these, again, are tools. They're not held to be ends in and of themselves. These are more skillful forms of clinging that you hold on to let, to let go of the grosser ones. And even your sense of self. You're the meditator here. You've got reasons for being here to meditate. And as long as you need to have that sense of yourself as the meditator who wishes yourself well, wishes other beings well, you're doing this for your sake and for the sake of others, that sense of self is a healthy one to develop. As we're practicing concentration, we're not fully letting go of clinging, but we've got better clinging so that we can let go of the, the unskillful ones. The Forrester Giants have an analogy for this. It's like climbing a ladder. You hold on to one rung with one hand, and then you reach up to the next one with the other hand. And only when you've held on tightly to that second one can you let go of the first one and then reach higher with the first hand, up to a higher rung and so on up. In other words, the, the clinging gets higher and higher, more and more refined. We're not here to clone awakening right away. We take steps to get there. The path doesn't cause awakening, but it does take you there. Ultimately, when you get to the top of the ladder, say you're climbing to the roof, you're on the roof again, then you can let go of the ladder, and you're still safe. But if on your way up you let go with both hands, you're going to fall. So you hold on to the concentration so you can let go of things that are more harmful. And you're getting very conscious of this level of awareness that has an impact on your consciousness. How you see things, how you listen to things, how you smell and taste and touch things, how you think about things. They're always shaped by these factors, the way you breathe, the way you talk to yourself inside, and the feelings and perceptions that shape your mind state. So try to bring knowledge to this. Get so you really discern what's going on here, asking the right questions so you can come to the right answers, answers that really do put an end to suffering. There are a lot of the questions in the world that don't have a real answer, but this is a question that has a very clear answer if you develop the skills on how to get to know this area of your awareness. And use it so that it's actually part of the path to the end of suffering. Because once you know this area, it helps you as you're living, and even when death comes. We talked a lot about this at the Q&A. 
there are going to be a lot of urges going in different directions, and you want to be as conscious as possible of what's happening as you realize you can't stay here anymore. As the Buddha points out, your consciousness doesn't have to depend on the body. It depends on it can depend on clinging and craving. Just as you go from one dream to another. It all happens right here. Your sense of right here. Even though, and again, as in a dream, your sense of right here in one dream changes into something else in the next dream. But you always have the feeling of being right here. But the world around right here will change. And the same happens as you leave this body and go to the next one. And it's these same processes involved. Your internal dialogue and the feelings and perceptions that underlie it. So you want to make sure they're well trained. So you can choose what you want to think about and what you don't want to think about. This, as the Buddha said, is one of the skills that you develop as you meditate. Something comes up in the mind, you don't want to think about it, you have the skill not to think about it. You can drop it and really drop it. Not just push it underground. If something is worth thinking about, okay, you can think about it. He's not teaching us to be totally blank. It's just he's putting us in control. We're no longer slave to these things because we're not operating under ignorance. We see clearly what's going on. We can shape it in the direction, point it in the direction we want. It's when you can do that that the mind is well-trained. And as the Buddha said, it's the well-trained mind that brings happiness. <laughs>